Dr. Goodall. Um, Jambo. Habari. Habari Ghani. <laughs> and Asante Sana. So that's our connection to Africa. Uh, you He's and I. Speaking his Swahili, by the way, for those yes, of you who don't know. Yes, for those know. of you that don't, don't know, I was born in Kenya, so I, I know Swahili. That's why Jambo and Asante Sana for being here. Um, we share a connection. Dr. Leakey used to come to my grandfather's barber shop for haircuts. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we share a history. We have seen elephants in their masses. I'm sure you have experienced the same. Maybe I don't know how long you've been in Africa. But I remember traveling from Nairobi to Mombasa and waiting on the road for hours as the elephant herds would cross the road. I was there in 57. I was born in 66. Exactly. So <laughs> I, exactly. That's why I said And it. so you've witnessed that. I remember my grandfather telling me, uh, actually showing me a picture of a square mile um, taken from the air with a Royal Air Force airplane um, off the ground with just elephant. So you can imagine how many elephants used to be in those days. Today, we know what the plight of the elephants and the rhinos are. What is the Jane Goodall Institute doing to help with that effort? We've seen the success at Gombe and around Africa, around chimpanzee conservation. Is there anything the Goodall Institute is doing around okay, well, that conservation? JGI is stretched to its limit to try and save chimpanzees in their forests. Fortunately, uh, when you save a forest, you, you hopefully can save the creatures in it, and there are forest elephants. So in places where there are forest elephants, we actually uh, cause one poacher to be arrested who had shot an elephant. But basically, it's, um, it's Jane using social media that's do doing the most as far as JGI. We're, we're not set up to help elephants, but I can help elephants. And so um, I think it's, I don't think it's over yet. I think we're in time. We've been putting out um, information on my blog about it's the March for the Rhinos and Elephants, and I think it's this week or next, maybe next week. And it's worldwide, and you can you can Google it. I see. You, uh, I follow you closely. On you've seen it, so <laughs> all right. So I, I also wrote a piece for World Elephant Day. We have our roots and shoots groups working, doing amazing things for elephants. So JGI itself can't, but roots and shoots can do anything. And so one of one of the things the roots and shoots are doing in Africa for elephants is they've discovered a mixture of crushed red pepper and elephant dung spread around the edge of crops will keep the elephants away. Bees. And bees, they're doing bees as well. The, the bees, because imagine bees up your trunk. Elephants are afraid <laughs> of bees. I mean, can you imagine? Oh, it makes it crazy. But uh, in addition, of course, one of the big problems for elephants and rhino is the demand. And the demand is, is so absurd now and the cost of ivory and rhino horn is so high that you've got your big international criminal gangs coming in. So we, we uh, are working very hard with our roots and shoots groups in, in China and Hong Kong and Singapore and other countries about don't buy ivory, what it means. And they have parents and it was quite, quite efficient what we did in China for shark's fin. So now working hard on for elephants and rhinos. I care about elephants probably as much as you do, or more. I've spent oh, hours watching them. We don't want to see them disappear. No, of course just, not. Yeah, just as much as we want every animal on this planet to be conserved, um, those, these animals are disappearing much faster than the normal rate. It's the sixth great extinction. Yes. And we're not going to let it happen. Another question. I have one. Ah. Please come down a little bit. We'll give you the mic. The enormous difference with a class of eight to 12 year olds with questions. 
If you were eight to 12 years old, I guarantee there'd be very few hands that weren't up. <laughs> uh, thank you, um, Ms. Goodall. That was a wonderful presentation. There was um, a really interesting TED talk that I uh, saw recently, and it was kind of exploring the differences between humans and chimpanzees. The presenter was saying that one of the main differences was that humans had the ability to cooperate. And one of the examples he, he said during his talk was that if you had a room of humans who were listening to another human talk, everybody in the audience was very quiet so they could hear. And he said that that wouldn't, wouldn't be true for chimpanzees. That was one of the, the ideas that humans have this ability to cooperate and chimpanzees don't. And I wondered if you had a, a take on that or could add some color to that at all. He was telling lies. <laughs> um, I have to stand up here because the lights are in my eyes otherwise. I can look out over the audience better this way. That's better. Um, chimpanzees actually can cooperate really well in the wild. The males have this amazing cooperation when they're patrolling the boundaries of the territory. And one of them will look over the valley, look around at the others, maybe reach out and touch. And this is a signal. And they all go off and they keep completely quiet. And if it's uh, leaves, dry leaves or grass, they'll sometimes go on the rocks so as not to make a noise. They may climb a tall tree, keep totally silent. And once uh, one of the young ones started playing with another and laughed and immediately was reprimanded because you've got to be quite quiet when you're looking out for... And then cooperating on these horrible gang attacks. But they also cooperate in hunt, cooperate in hunting and surround a tree and go to the places where the prey might escape and then one will go creeping up and so either, either the, the one will catch the monkey or some of those others who are stationed in escape routes will catch it. So they, they definitely can cooperate and in captivity they do all kinds of tests uh, which prove absolutely chimpanzees can cooperate with each other. Of course with the with the example given of a room of people talking and everybody going silent, that doesn't make sense because chimps don't talk. So, you know, his example wasn't a very sensible one. <laughs> There's a question there and there. Thanks a million, Jane. That was fascinating. Um, you mentioned uh, how when you were a little girl, the technology that we have now would have seemed like science fiction or magic. If you could wave your magic wand now and, and invent a technology for 10 years from now that we should all be working on, what would you like to see, a, see come next or what, what things could most further your work? Oh my goodness, I'd have to think about that. I don't think I can answer you off the top of my head because it's such an interesting question. Um, hmm, could you, do you, does something leap into your mind? What would be the most energy. exciting, what? Well, the clean green energy, you mean, you mean anything? Sure, yeah. Yes, well, to, to be released from fossil fuels, to have no more of these chemicals being sprayed over our fields, to go back from um, agribusiness intensive monocultures to the proper kind of farming, permaculture and so forth. But that's not really technology, that's going back to an old wisdom that we have pushed aside or some people have. But yes, getting, getting rid of fossil fuels, indeed. Yeah. I was wondering if over time, in the areas you worked in, you had to deal with uh, oh, um, uh, mining, both illegal and legal. I work on a watershed project in Peru. and. It's our primary concern at this point, just because of the area we're in and what we're trying to preserve. And I was wondering if over time you guys had had some experience with that and if we could get some pointers on our watershed project. Well, around Gombe, fortunately, there's, no, there's nothing to mine for. They've had problems in, in uh, Congo, Brazzaville, and I know there's a lot of problems in DRC. Do you have any wise comments to make about ways of dealing with Mining? Well, um, mining is uh, it, it's something which we, I mean, the watershed approach is that um, 
it turns out that watershed approach would, it's the best way for us to connect with people um, livelihoods through ecosystem services if we respect the watersheds uh, and usually it means forests it means that we could probably find a balance between having land uses also for people to have their crops maybe other uses um, but also um, have forests for the for the champs as a habitat so watershed approach actually was behind that map if you saw it, all the village reserves are on top of watershed, protecting critical watersheds. And actually, people came to us when we were doing land use planning, uh, conservation planning, and said, could you please think about watersheds? Because that year, when we did the cap, it was, uh, I think, in, um, an El Nino year, where they had a lot of um, rain. So everybody experienced landslides and everyone realized that what we have been talking since 1994, it's happening and climate change is happening, so. I think he's meaning, what do you do? You know about the value of the watershed, yeah. but when the mining company is coming in, um, especially in Peru, I know, I know about that, yeah, and yeah, polluting the, the entire watershed. Course, it's uh, the rough equivalent of poaching, though, on the land, yeah. where illegal mining takes place, and of course they're using crude methods to extract gold, and, and horribly polluting the water. The water. One thing which we do in Eastern DRC, which is equally challenging um, and incredible, I mean, it's incredible challenging and risky to work there, is we try to empower people at the territory level who are supposed to zone and manage mining and try to empower them with spatial information. Because mining is a use of natural resources, and in some areas could be okay right. if a smart land use plan is done with both wildlife and people in mind. So it's all about planning, it's not about stopping mining, at least in the work which we do on the ground, we can't say that. We have to work with a variety of land uses, including mining, but can we use this information and tools, including imagery, to do a better job? And can we empower the people who then can, because they get, you know, they will, they're supposed to get taxes and so on coming, so they have an interest. It's just they don't have the tools and power to, to go through. So that would be another opportunity. And can we eliminate corruption too? <laughs> <laughs> well, this goes hand in hand. And, and by the way, um, Jane mentioned, you know, about the, the GPS helps us see a transparent if that forest monitor really visited that area. It's not so much for GGI, it's for about each other. It's a community thing. So suddenly see, oh, wait a minute. I just spent so many days in the forest and my neighbor didn't. So suddenly there is uh, accountability and transparency, which something really interesting is happening, deals with corruption and empowerment. And, it's, and again, it's, the experiment is going on, it's not there. It will be interesting to see how it ends up in increasing democracy, hopefully. Hi. Um, so this journey began with your love and connection with the animals, and yet I heard that you travel three, oh sorry, you travel 300 days a year now. So how do you reconcile that? Because it sounds like you're now pretty far removed from the animals. I desperately try and get a dog fix every day. <laughs> you know, I go up to people in the street. <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's something I just have to live with. And I do any, any possible opportunity, I try and get out, even if it's a little bit of nature, even if it's for a short time. Uh, but my days of being at peace in the forest are over. Even if, even if I could be out in the forest, I wouldn't be at peace because I know that that's not helping anything if I'm enjoying myself in the forest. It did in the early days because what I was discovering about chimps changed the way people thought, you know, related to, to animals. And by the way, let me share this with you since we're onto animals. For a long time, you know, people resented, so many people were resenting the similarities between us and even chimpanzees. And then gradually science began to accept when the field studies came in about elephants and lions and so forth, they began to accept, well, yeah, we've been a bit wrong. These other animals, you know, they, they are much more intelligent than we thought. Parrot owners kept saying, my parrot definitely understands 
uh, some of the words that he or she is using. Is they're said in the right context at the right time. But, say the skeptics, bird brain is structured differently from the mammalian brain. Therefore, this kind of cognitive ability is not possible for birds. Until in Oxford University, they were working on crows. And you know, crows are very highly intelligent. And it was a simple test. There was a glass tube with a, some food reward at the bottom and a piece of wire with a hook on the end. The birds found it easy. They pushed it down, they pulled out the food, no problem. And then the hook broke off. Well, this was very frustrating. And you can imagine lots of poking away and nothing happening. I think the reward was a peanut. So you can poke a peanut with a piece of wire and it won't be very productive. And then, and I don't know how long it was after the hook broke off, but one bird uh, with beak and foot bent a hook and got out the reward. Oh, the, so the researchers were so excited, but the skeptics said, well, that was just a mistake. It just happened by chance. Well, if it did happen by chance, that bird certainly made good use of the chance experience and did the same thing the next day and the next day and <laughs> the next day. And so then the skeptic said, but there's only one of the two birds doing it. This must be an aberrant bird. I mean, OK, very aberrant bird. Um, but why was only one doing it? That was the female. Every time she took out the reward, the male took it. So the motto is, if you have a wife, you don't need to bother to make a tool. <laughs> One here, one here. This one? Um, one quick question. I've been staring at this picture behind you, actually, during most of your talk, and I just have to ask the question, what was that experience like for you, that first moment that you were able to maintain contact, physical contact, with a chimpanzee? Because you mentioned during your talk that the beginning of your journey, you were f so far removed because they saw you as the white ape and they had never seen that before. So what was that first moment like? Well, or even that moment within this picture? This, this moment um, was very early on. That's little Flint when he's about three months old, just beginning to walk. And the magic of it was that his mother trusted me now so much that she let her precious little infant come out and reach out. The first time he did it, it's actually the cover of the book The Geographic produced. It's one of my favorite pictures. And he's coming towards the camera. I have my back to it. And his mother is still not quite sure. So she's standing there behind him. And she's got a hand around his tummy. And he's reaching up. And you see those big, wondering eyes. And he touches my nose. And it was such a magical moment, just as when David Greybeard let me groom him. We don't touch them anymore. We know that they can catch our diseases. When this was happening, you know, I didn't expect that I'd be able to stay for more than, much more than one or two years, because nobody did back then. It was unheard of. But once, once I realized that, you know, we can stay and stay and bring in students, then we mustn't touch them because we don't want to mess up their lives. Thank you, Dr. Goodall, for coming out. I do have a question about scientific research. And what impact would you say that the methods you have practiced and had, had corroborated by others, what impact does natural observation now have on zoology and, and other, have those practices changed? Well, I think, that, I think the main thing that's changed is that science is now open to so many new aspects. So young people going into animal behavior, for example, today, I mean, they can actually study animal personality. They can even study um, animal emotions. I could not have studied them because I was told they didn't exist. And so, you know, people often say, well, why is it that girls are not going into science? I think the, the perception of science is something objective and cold. And I was told, you can't have empathy with your subject because that isn't scientific. And I think that's Tommy rot. Because um, you can actually, I mean, I've got some, I've got, I've got information on tape. 
and it was the most horrible thing that happened. A little infant had broken her arm. I think she'd been attacked. And her mother was a first-time mother, and she didn't understand at all what was happening. And every time the infant screamed, she would cradle her, and that, of course, hurt the arm more, and she screamed louder. And I have tears going down my face, but if you listen to what I'm saying on the tape, it's completely objective, like each minute what's happening. So it's a question of self-discipline. And I think that's one of the things that's gone wrong in science, is that we have uh, tried to cut out empathy. I mean, we're human beings, we're not machines. Maybe in, in uh, 50 years there'll be more machines than humans doing the things humans do, but in which case I don't know what the rest of us will be doing, but I'm not sure. Does that answer your question? I think that provides a great perspective. Okay. I'm curious. It's on. It's on. <laughs> I'm curious if you've actually tried to um, engage the apes, um, the chimpanzees, with the iPads and the mapping themselves. Because <laughs> you were saying that it's possible, like you were talking about the chimpanzee in Japan, and that they have a great capacity to learn these systems and tools and how they would choose to map their own environments. I'm actually curious if that's been considered. Well, we do, we do not interfere at all with the Gombe chimps. We're there to observe them. And in fact, they're so endangered now in so many parts of their range. We, d we haven't even learned about their own cultures yet. So the last thing we want to do with the wild chimps is to interfere and change their cultures before we've even come to properly understand them. You know, after 55 years, we're still learning new things about the Gombe chimps, and they've been studied for, for so long. And they can live to be more than 60. And so it's a very long-term study you need. Uh, but it's it, with the captive chimps, where sometimes this kind of experimentation with technology and so forth, it serves as enrichment of their environment, because they get bored. So one of the things we, we, JGI does going around the zoos with chimps is to enrich the environment, and that means challenging them, giving them, giving them tasks to perform, instead of just throwing their food at them. One last question. There are two. We better have these two. Yes. Is it on? Thank you. Uh, well. Living in Africa, which is probably fairly corrupted compared with America. Do you say it's fairly corrupted compared with America? <laughs> it's maybe less corrupted. <laughs> uh, yes, probably. <laughs> what would you say to American lawmakers that there is a single most important action that American lawmakers can make to make it to stop deforestation in, in these countries, let's say Africa or South America? with the oncoming elections, we as a voters, what can we ask them? What would you do to have international influence to stop deforestation? Well, one of, one of the things, remember I'm not an American, but, but one of the things is to put climate change up as an issue. And it's, the Republicans hardly mention it at all. And yet climate change uh, one of the great drivers of, of global warming is deforestation because it's releasing CO2 into the atmosphere. The other uh, really important thing that impacts climate change is the fact that as countries get wealthier, more and more meat is eaten. And we, are now, we now have these horrendous factory farms where billions, cows, pigs, poultry, etc., are being raised to be eaten. Huge areas of forest are cut down to grow grain to feed them. Cattle are pushed further and further into forests, which they change to woodland, and eventually it becomes totally degraded. We see it in Tanzania. I've seen it in Argentina and many other places. And so if, if these, these complex interrelated contributors to, to uh, global warming could be addressed by the politicians, this could really make a very big impact. Climate change is threatening the planet. And although there is no consensus about the frequency of hurricanes and, 
and <clears throat> these other kinds of storms and, and so forth. I mean, look at the storm that's, that's now nobody can even predict where it's going to go with the best computer models. And they say that's the first time this has happened. Hello, uh, I'm honored to have the last question and um, I've just been in awe about your research. Um, basically, if the chimps are so similar to us, um, is there any message that you could pass along to us and to future generations from the chimps um, as to how, are there any insights as to human behavior and how we can be a better species uh, to to be better in conservation. Um, they, they mirror us in so many different ways and given your vast experience over the past decades of uh, chimpanzee conservation and behavior and uh, their family life, are there any parallels that you could draw between them and us to uh, inform us how we should um, improve our, our lives? I think one, uh, one thing that's very important that I've learned from them uh, as what I started with, the tremendous importance of early experience. And you find in many countries that when governments start making cuts, what do they, what do they cut? They cut these programs uh, of early experience. And they, they So what a human as well as a chimp child needs in those first two, three years is to have a trusting relationship with responsible adults two, three, four, something like that. It doesn't have to be the biological mother because some mothers, some women, simply aren't cut out to be mothers. They're impatient, uh, they've got their career comes first, but then the daycare centers, they are sometimes so poorly staffed. The staff have no proper credentials. There's a big turnover. And this is the future of a nation, how the children are treated in those early years. And you know, when I was at that prison this morning, um, I was thinking, these people, some of them have done um, very terrible things. And so they're looked upon as the scum. In fact, somebody said they're not treated harshly enough. But I ask myself, if I grew up in the situation that some of them did, would I be any better? I don't know. We all like to think that we've got all these morals and that we wouldn't steal and we wouldn't do this, that, and the other. We can't tell how we would behave if we were put in some of the horrendous situations in which people are brought up in low-income families in so many parts of the world. So my message from the chimps is pay attention to those early years of childhood. Let's spend more time with fa family values and all the rest of it. Good last question. Thanks. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Pintea. We look forward to working with you in the coming years. Very excited for uh, exploring the boundaries of your research and our capabilities as we move forward. And to the uh, incomparable uh, Jane Goodall, thank you for your achievements and your time with us.